Behold, the world's least exciting graph. Look, <laughs> this is Gallup's daily tracking poll, starting with the day before the Republican convention and continuing through Monday, this past Monday. See what I mean by least exciting? We showed this graph on Monday night. Uh, right before the start of the Democratic convention to try to understand if the Republican convention last week gave Mitt Romney a bounce. That's no bounce. Well, today, the world's least exciting graph gets updated. Uh, This is Gallup's daily tracking poll, again, starting with the day before the Republican convention. But now it goes through the first two days of the Democratic convention this week. And so, yeah, even though this does not yet reflect any reaction to the president's acceptance speech, because it's just the first two days of the Democrats' convention, at least from the first part of the convention, there is some evident Obama bounce apparent to the naked eye. Mr. Obama went up by one point to 48 points. Mr. Romney went down a point to 45 points. So, hey, arithmetic, the president got a two-point swing. And uh, he leads by three now in what amounts to this national poll. So that's something. But that's not the election. National polling does not really matter because presidential elections are not won at the national level. Presidential elections are won state by state. You win individual states, you get their electoral votes from those states. It doesn't matter how many votes Mitt Romney gets in California. He's going to lose that state, and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter how many votes President Obama gets in Oklahoma. He's going to lose Oklahoma no matter what. It is only the states in contention that really matter, and they are the only ones that get fought over once the campaign has been joined in earnest, which it now has. Barack Obama and Joe Biden went racing out of Charlotte today to get back on the stump. First, they went to New Hampshire, and then they went to Iowa. You will remember that Governor Romney did not get on the campaign bus and get back on the stump after his convention. He instead got on his boat. Uh, Instead of making a big swing through the states where he really needs to go compete and win, uh, Mr. Romney for the last week has been boating and debate prepping in Vermont at what is being described in the local Vermont press as a very fancy mansion. Uh, But today Mitt Romney finally did get back on the trail after his boating time and his mansion time. And this is really telling. Here's how you know it's going to go for the rest of the year. As President Obama today went to New Hampshire and then Iowa... What did Mitt Romney today do? He went to Iowa and then New Hampshire. It's not a coincidence that they've got parallel itineraries. Mr. Romney is also launching a huge expensive ad blitz in Iowa and in New Hampshire. Uh, He's using a clip from his convention speech and making a promise about how many jobs he will bring. So Iowa and New Hampshire, you are not just going to be seeing a lot of Mitt Romney the candidate, Mitt Romney the man. You're also going to be seeing Mitt Romney ads all the time. And so are you, North Carolina and Colorado and Nevada and Florida and Ohio and Virginia. The eight states that are being targeted in this ad campaign, uh, an ad campaign so big the campaign describes it as a carpet bombing. And this list of states, the states that you see marked on this map right here, that is pretty much where the election is going to be fought out from here on out. And this map, you will notice, doesn't include all of the places we've been thinking of and talking about as swing states. The Romney campaign is not placing its new ads in Wisconsin, in Michigan, or in Pennsylvania. The super PACs that support Mitt Romney have also pulled their ads from Michigan. Mr. Romney's trailing in Michigan by as much as seven points there. Uh, The the pro-Romney PAC money has also dropped out of Pennsylvania, where Mr. Romney is also behind in the polls. The Romney campaign and the PACs together, of course, have more money than God and Mick Jagger combined, so they could still decide to spend money wherever, whenever. They almost have infinite resources in terms of ad dollars in this campaign season. But unless something changes in their strategy, it looks like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania are out, and so the 2012 election is down to these eight states. This is a very narrow playing field. And so the specifics of what happens in these few states, the technical aspects of how voting is going to go in these eight states, becomes something of national importance. And so it is of national importance that we got news today out of Ohio, uh, where Republicans tried to cut the final three days of early voting before the election. You know that the Obama campaign sued the state of Ohio over that, trying to get those days of early voting back. Last week, a judge ordered the state of Ohio to restore those three days of early voting. Ohio's Republican Secretary of State John Husted announced that he would appeal that ruling, and while he was appealing it, he would ignore the court order telling him to go ahead with early voting. He said there was no valid reason for him to restore the voting hours now. I mean, besides that whole federal court ordering him to restore the early voting hours. Yesterday, the judge in the case issued another order, issued another order that, that ordered 
John Husted to come back to court personally and explain why he thinks a federal court ruling should not apply to him. That got Mr. Husted's attention. Mr. Husted rescinded his original order and he filed a new brief with the court in which he apologized to the court for any misimpressions. He also asked for a stay of the court's order that Ohio restored these early voting rights. So while John Husted is very, very, very sorry and would like very much not to be held in contempt of court in Ohio, he would also like not to restore those three days of early voting right before the election when last time around 93,000 people voted in Ohio, including a very large number of African American voters who were voting for Barack Obama. In terms of voters knowing the basics of what to expect in Ohio, knowing even when they can vote, it is kind of a mess right now. And Ohio is going to be really important this year. And it's getting late in the game. And then there's Virginia. Virginia has been weird all year uh, for quite different reasons. Virginia essentially did not have a primary for the Republican presidential nomination this year. Getting on the ballot in Virginia is hard. The state requires you to gather hundreds of signatures in each congressional district. So you can't just, like, go to the mall in Alexandria and have a good day and say it's done for the state. You have to be all over the state. But in the Republican primary this year, of the half dozen candidates who were still in the running at the time that Virginia was holding its primary, only two of them qualified to make the ballot. That's how hard it was to get on the ballot. Only Mitt Romney and Ron Paul got their names on the ballot. Rick Perry and Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum and John Huntsman, they all tried to make the ballot but they all failed to make the ballot for that primary in Virginia. And so that primary in Virginia essentially didn't matter. It didn't really exist. But you know who did make it onto the ballot for the general election in November? This guy. Hello? Who are you? Uh, It's a former congressman named Virgil Good. Virgil Good is a traveling man, ideologically speaking. He has been a Democrat and an independent and a Republican. But this year, Virgil Good is running for president as the nominee of the rather right, libertarian-ish, pilgrim-era, family values, constitution party. And he will be on the ballot in November along with the major party candidates. Now, think about this strategically. Mitt Romney does not want to see Virgil Goode's name on the ballot as another right-wing candidate, right? He doesn't want to see Virgil Goode's name there as a choice for conservative Virginians other than him. Virginia's Republican Party challenged Virgil Good's nominating petitions last week. They said Virgil Good really didn't have enough valid signatures to qualify. Mr. Romney and the Republicans do not want him on the ballot because look at how he's polling. He's polling as high as 9%, and presumably those votes would otherwise go to Mitt Romney, and he needs every vote he can get in Virginia. One Virginia Republican said, quote, if you want to see Barack Obama reelected president of the United States, do whatever you can for Virgil Good." Virginia Republicans challenged Virgil Goode's spot on the ballot, and the Virginia Board of Elections said, put him on the ballot anyway. And Virgil Goode is going to be on the ballot. Unless Virginia's attorney general, this guy, Ken Cuccinelli, uh, decides to kick Virgil Goode off the ballot. Ken Cuccinelli has been campaigning for Mitt Romney, including last week at the Republican convention. Under Virginia law, Ken Cuccinelli gets to decide whether Virgil Goode gets his name on the ballot or not. He promises, look, Look at the headline. He promises that he will be absolutely objective. Absolutely objective about this whole thing. Absolutely. Virginia is getting three different Mitt Romney ads this week. Virginia, Ohio, New Hampshire, Iowa, Colorado, Nevada, North Carolina, Florida. That's it. That's the election. That is who the country is counting on to handle this decision about the presidency for the rest of us. Eight states. So when stuff gets weird in one of those eight states... And something like Virgil Good happens in one of those eight states. While that might be a weird sidebar Virginia story at any other time in any other political circumstances, right now, Virgil Good is of national political importance. Joining us now is Steve Kornacki, co-host of MSNBC's The Cycle and a senior writer for Salon.com. Steve, welcome back. Great to have you have you here. Great to be here. Did you have a good time at the convention? I had a great time. It was the crowd was really it was a lot of energy there. I, I wasn't ready for that, but there were tons of people, and it was just it was exciting to be there. Is it now that you are um, a big MSNBC TV star? Were you weirded out that everybody knows who you are? Well, I, I said <laughs> I, I, it doubled as an MSNBC convention. It felt like, but I, I had to say, like a lot of times, people would come up to me and say. You're that guy who's down with Rachel Maddow. Why isn't she here? So you you were missed. I could have sent you a little cardboard me. Um, If you were a Republican strategist, 
How concerned would you be about Virgil Good on the ballot in Virginia? I, no, I think that this is legitimate. I mean, it, it's a very sort of narrow set of circumstances where this could end up being decisive in the presidential election. It needs to be, you know, razor thin in the electoral college. So we're basically at, you know, a 50-50 race, and it comes down to Virginia. Virginia is the decisive state, sort of the way Florida was in 2000, Ohio was in 2004. And then it comes into play. Okay, how many votes does he have and who is he stealing it from? And you think back to 2000, look at the example of, like, Pat Buchanan down in Florida. Now, that was the result of ballot confusion. But you look at all of those accidental votes that Pat Buchanan got and how that skewed that state. Or you could look at Ralph Nader and say the same thing with the 90. 3,000 that he got. The, the thing about Virgil Good is it, everywhere else in the country, he would be a fringe candidate who would get a, a microscopic share of the vote. But he has a deep political base and he has deep political roots in southwest Virginia. This is a guy who you say the name Virgil Good in New York and California and Texas. Who is he? Right. You say the name in southwest Virginia. They know this guy. And we've been talking all year about how Mitt Romney does not, has a problem, you know, with the enthusiasm of the Republican Party base. So this is that. There's this one sort of very small corner of the country where not only does the Republican base maybe have a little bit of a problem with Mitt Romney, but there is a conservative on the ballot who they actually know and who to, to them is a legitimate political figure, a guy who served, I think, you know, 12 years in the House. He was in the legislature forever down there in Virginia. This is a guy they know. And again, it, it, all he needs in that corner of the state maybe is about 10%. That, that starts to affect the statewide total. So, yeah, it, 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 could, it could be big. And we're at, the point in the, we're at the point in the campaign when the field is being narrowed and... So, therefore, we get magnified political import of these internal dynamics in these individual states. And because of that, I feel like we ought to question whether or not the field really is narrowed. Like, we've got this decision from the Romney campaign to get out of Wisconsin and put Michigan and Pennsylvania. The Romney super PACs essentially followed suit on that. Are they doing that potentially as a, as a fake? Is, is, there, is, is this a commitment that actually they have to now follow through on leading up to the election? It has big consequences. I, I think they're trying to. I think part of this was look, they wanted to make some news here coming right out of the Democratic convention. They've also got this pile of money they can start spending now because he's officially the Republican nominee. So this is sort of the start. They're trying to make some, some hints now, leave some hints out there that they could go back and expand this later to Wisconsin, to Michigan, to Pennsylvania. But the interesting thing to me is when we start talking about these swing states, I think the way this sort of gets conventionally um, talked about in politics, I think we have it slightly wrong, where we look at it and we say, well, we've got the national polls, but let's really look at the swing states. And, and when you do that, you see that Obama's ahead in all these swing states right now. And, and we come to this conclusion, I hear this a lot, that, there's, that Mitt Romney has this narrow path to 270, that there's this extra challenge for Mitt Romney on top of the popular vote. And I think we're reading it wrong. I think the fact that Barack Obama is leading in all these swing states tells us that Barack Obama has been leading in the presidential race all year. This, the race is commonly, you hear, you know, dead even, neck and neck, virtual tie. That's generally how this thing gets talked about. If you look at, I think the best thing to do is not to look at, you know, individual polls here and there, Gallup here, you know, uh, PPP there. Look at these poll averages, like Real Clear Politics does them, HuffPost does them, where they average everything together and they come up with that trend line. If you look back at Real Clear Politics, Barack Obama has been ahead since Mitt Romney became the Republican nominee, and it's fluctuated a little bit. Basically, it's been two to three points. And, and that's you're looking ahead, at an electoral college count, right? And then, yeah. So, it's, so that, yeah, if you're ahead two to three points nationally, you're going to be ahead in Ohio, in Virginia, in Colorado, in all these states. If Mitt Romney can turn around and get ahead two to three nationally, he takes the lead in these states. But I think the conclusion is he's been, Barack Obama's been winning this year. Even without Virgil Good. That's right. <laughs> Steve <laughs> Kornacki, uh, senior writer at Salon.com, co-host of The Cycle, which is weekdays at 3 o'clock Eastern here on MSNBC. Steve, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Salon. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. One of the most notable speakers at the Democratic Convention is here tonight. She is Nancy Keenan of NARAL. She's going to be talking with us about the fresh news about the 2012 campaign and, of course, the lady parts. <laughs> That's the interview tonight. We'll be right back. <laughs> 